Now, from approximately coast to coast, it's the Bob and Ray Radio Show. Okay, thanks, Paul. And uh, we have so much material here today, I think we should get going with it. So many guests, I don't know, they're... They're all lined up, uh, waiting to come in, as we call them. The green room, I've never seen it filled, so... uh, with uh, so many people. And they're having a great time. They get a great feast out there in the green room. We'll tell you about it. Sometime. And all their agents are uh, sitting, have all the good chairs. You notice that? <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, again today we have with us our consumer affairs expert, Hoyt Nutley of Syracuse University. Uh, Mr. Nutley, I believe, Nutley, is that right? N-E-T? Net- Netley. N- Netley. I believe you told us uh, when you were here before that your work at Syracuse is not totally involved with consumer affairs. Well, it's totally involved with consumer affairs to the extent that everyone is a consumer. Our uh-huh. dean of the medieval art department and his three full-time restoration experts are all consumers when you stop to think about it. Uh-huh. And uh, those are the people you work with on a daily basis at the university, are they? No, I haven't seen any of them in months. But you don't have to see a consumer every day to know that he's an ongoing co- consumer. No, I suppose not. And uh, you're making it obvious that you're still not ready to tell us exactly what you do up there uh, at the university. Well, it's not that I'm being secretive. It's just uh, none of your business. Okay. All right, well, let's uh, move on into some of the consumer products that you brought with you today to evaluate for our listeners. All right, well, I have one item here, Ray, that I certainly want to advise parents not to buy for their children. Now, you'll notice that the metal parts on this all have rounded corners, so the device looks as if it would be perfectly safe. But I found there's an engine underneath the seat here, and that can be quite dangerous in the hands of a small child. Well, I don't know uh, why you think parents would buy one of those for a small child, Mr. Nutley. That's a full-size motorcycle. Yes, it is. And the worst part is that the engine under the seat will activate the wheels, so you can imagine the trouble it might cause if parents saw this in a toy store and bought it. Well, you didn't find this thing in a toy store, did you? No, I found it in a Harley-Davidson showroom. And since your secretary told me to buy any consumer product I needed for the show and put it on my expense account, I picked this out to warn parents about. Well, I'm sure you won't be able to collect from us on that. But uh, we won't discuss it while we're on the air. Uh, What's next here? Well, this is my shopper's bargain of the week, Ray. As you may know, most of the cleaning fluid that's sold to get spots out of clothing and upholstery costs about, oh, two, three dollars for a very small can. But I purchased a full gallon of this in bulk form for less than a dollar and twenty cents. Well, that's certainly a bargain. But uh, since it comes in bulk form and uh, in an unmarked container, can you tell our listeners uh, what to ask for when they go in to buy it? I just asked for regular unleaded gasoline. I plan to put it in the motorcycle I demonstrated earlier. And when I spilled a little on my jacket, I noticed how nicely it cleaned off a grape juice stain. That's when I realized it also makes a good low-cost cleaning fluid. But, of course, you have to take care not to use it around an open flame. Well, maybe so. I never thought of using it around an open flame. I have electric lights where I live. I see. I think electricity is a wise purchase for any budget-minded consumer, but I didn't bring any of it with me today to demonstrate. Well, uh, we can save that for another time, then. Uh, Let's move along now to uh, one final quick tip. All right. Here's an item on sale this week at a national chain of hardware and appliance stores. When I tell you that it was only $19.95... You'll appreciate what a bargain I got. Well, I guess I might if I knew what it was. <laughs> Apparently you don't have a remote control television set, Ray, so you're not aware that one of them costs about $50 more than a set without this remote control box. Well, actually, I do have remote control TV, but this tuner looks different than mine. Well, uh, Does it work all right? I presume it does. I don't have a television set myself, but... I'm convinced that this baby has the power to do the job. Well, how can you know that if you don't have a TV? Well, it makes my garage door go up and down, so that's proof enough for me. Uh Uh-huh. And a bargain hunter certainly can't go wrong to buy one at a mere $19.95. So, I want to thank you for sharing another valuable consumer tip with us. And I'm sure our listeners will be all looking forward to the next visit here from Mr. Hoyt Netley, the Bob and Ray Consumer Affairs Advisor. And now, once again, it's time to pick up some valuable hints for all you home handymen as we pay another of our regular visits 
to the basement workshop of Fred Falvey, the do-it-yourselfer. And Fred, I noticed on the way in that uh, you have a new hammock out there on the porch. Is that another of your do-it-yourself projects? Uh, Yes, it is, Ray. The wife brought some new draperies for the uh, living room last week, and I realized that one of the old ones would make a fine hammock. So I just attached ordinary household rope to either end with a number six stapling gun. The whole project was completed in one evening. Well, I'm sure our beloved listeners will regard it as still another example of better living by doing it yourself. But uh, just one thing, Fred. Uh, Why do you have the hammock strung between those two posts at the top of your front steps? I couldn't get past it, so I had to go around and come in the back door. Yes, everybody has to go around to the back now, Ray, but that's only temporary. I've already planted some seedlings in the yard, and as soon as the trees get big enough to string a hammock between them, I can stop using those posts on the porch. Well, that could take 20 years, couldn't it? Oh, no. I selected Lombardy poplars because they're a fast-growing tree, and the nurseryman told me they'll be sturdy enough to support the hammock in six or eight years at the most. Well, I should have known you'd think of everything, Fred, and I'm sure the home handyman and our audience are all anxious now to hear about the do-it-yourself project that you'll be describing today. Ray, the do-it-yourself project I want to describe to the home handyman today is a real money-saver. We all know how the price of books has gone up recently, but most do-it-yourselfers don't realize that they can print their own right in the basement workshop, and they don't even need to buy type or a printing press. Just a few pieces of scrap lumber and some simple tools will do nicely. You know, that sounds like a wonderful project for our fond listeners, Fred, but how can you print a book using nothing but scrap lumber. Well, it's really quite simple, Ray. Now, you can see I've started here on a pine board that measures about 5 by 7 inches. You'll notice I've copied the first page of a book very lightly in pencil on the board. A number 3 pencil is best for that. Uh huh. I see the book you're using is uh, Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. Is that uh, the only one you can use for this oh, no. project? Oh, no, no. You can print any book you want, Ray. Little Women just happens to be one of my favorites. So I began by copying the first page <laughs> this piece of wood. Uh-huh. Then I took an ordinary number nine chisel and began cutting very carefully around each of the printed letters. And I suppose that's to uh, elevate the lettering above the surface of the wood so you can make a printed impression of it later. No, that's to lower the surface of the wood so the lettering will stand out above it. Then I can make a printed impression later. I guess I didn't fully understand the principle of the thing. Well, it's really quite simple, Ray. In fact, I've already finished chiseling away part of the excess wood on this board, and I can show you how it's possible to print a clear impression of what I have so far. Oh, that's fine. I'd like to see how it comes out. And I suppose uh, that's ordinary printer's ink you're now putting on the wood with that roller? No, this is number eight printer's ink, Ray. Ordinary ink's too thick to get clear down into the grain of the wood. Now, I'll just place an ordinary sheet of number four white paper over the lettering and pound on it with a ball-peen hammer to make the impression. Gee, I'm anxious uh, to see what you've got there as you peel off the paper. Looks like a T and an H. And part of a C. <laughs> no, that last letter is going to be an E when I've chiseled out the center of it, Ray. You see, the first word in the preface to Little Women is the. I see. So you haven't quite finished chiseling out the first word yet, but when it's done, it'll just leave you the rest of this page and about, uh, what, 400 more pages to do? How long do you oh, think the whole project will take, Fred? Well, I don't know, Ray. I've only been working on it for about a week so far, and I'm in no rush to finish. That's one reason I selected Little Women. It'll be as popular 50 years from now as it is t- t- today. Yes, I'm sure it will, Fred. Copies of the book will make lovely gifts for all your friends whenever you finish printing it. So, uh, once again, we've seen a typical example of better living by doing it yourself. Direct from the basement workshop of Fred Falvey, the do-it-yourselfer. Friends, do you sit at home alone night after night, waiting in vain for the telephone to ring? Do you sometimes call up the drugstore and order stuff you don't need just so you can enjoy a brief moment of companionship with the young squirt who comes over on his bicycle to deliver it? Haven't you often wished that those in the mainstream of life would ask you to join their social groups so that you too could get out of the house and horse around? Well, now that long-cherished dream can become a reality, neighbors. Not just once, but many times. Thanks to the special introductory offer being made by the Bob and Ray 
Club of the Month Club. It sounds incredible, but it's true, friends. Once you're enrolled as a member of the Bob and Ray Club of the Month Club, you'll receive all the credentials you need to join a new and different social group each and every month. The doorway will be open for you to make hundreds of new friends around your own age, and perhaps even a few of other ages. And you'll be caught up in a mad whirl of gay activity as you shuttle from one club to another every 30 days. Of course, we don't expect you to join the Bob and Ray Club of the Month Club on our say-so alone, so let us read to you from some of the unsolicited letters of appreciation that come pouring in. A woman in Nebraska writes, I never realized how full and rich life could be until your wonderful club arranged for me to join the 6th Street Marauders. Now I experience the conviviality of a rumble almost every night. And if things go as I expect, I'll soon become the first 62-year-old woman ever sentenced to the juvenile detention hall. From a man in Pennsylvania, this heartfelt message. At first, I wondered whether I could fit in with the Make a Better World for Our Children Council. But after we all got to Washington to demonstrate against Senate Bill 1728, I felt just like one of the gang. And I can never thank you enough for the lasting friendships you enabled me to make on the picket line. P.S. What is Senate Bill 1728? And finally, this letter from a woman in Michigan. She writes, I was just a stay-at-home wallflower until the club's July selection made me a full-fledged member of the Palm Beach Yachting Society. Of course, you neglected to send a yacht along with my membership card, but I still managed to place third in our annual race to Nassau and was the only finisher in the top ten to get there without a boat. Naturally, you too will want to open the door to a whole new life by joining the Bob and Ray Club of the Month Club. So why not get your membership application into the mail now and take advantage of our special bonus offer. If your request to join is postmarked before midnight tonight, you will receive, at no additional charge, all the credentials you need to become an active member of the University of Western Montana Alumni Association. Know the fun of attending class reunions. And of course, unlike the other grads, you can pick any class that appeals to you since you never attended the college anyway. But the annual reunion is just one of the benefits of Alumni Association membership, friends. You'll receive loads of mail from the college asking for donations. You'll be able to join the crowd as they hang the football coach in effigy. And last but far from least, you can get stewed to the eyeballs alongside the other grads at homecoming. Now, regrettably, membership in the Bob and Ray Club of the Month Club must be limited to the first few thousand idiots we can hook, so apply now and avoid disappointment. Just jot down the words, I want to be clubbed, on a postcard, and mail it to Bob and Ray, Togetherness, New York. And now, return with us again to Gary's Summit and its tangled web of intrigue among the socially prominent. There, in stately splendor, far removed from the squalid village below, they fight their petty battles over power and money. As our action resumes, wealthy dowager Agatha Murchfield is hanging up the phone in the lavishly furnished drawing room as her spineless son Rodney enters, Agatha speaks. Rodney, I've just received a disturbing phone call that's thrown me into a terrible quandary. I'm sorry, Mother. I'll ring for the servants and have them bring a pitcher of lemonade. My word, Rodney, this is a matter that requires thought. You can't solve every problem with lemonade. I never considered that. It works for me. Well, I've just been speaking with the police. They've found your fugitive brother Caldwell in Bolivia. But he can't be extradited to this country unless I sign the papers agreeing to press charges against him for stealing money from the family business. Well, I don't see that as a problem, Mother. I have a spare pen if you can't find yours. Rodney, I'm speaking of felony charges that could send your only brother to prison. Doesn't that mean anything to you? Of course, Mother. Let me go get my best pen for you to sign the extradition papers. It's monogrammed and cost $125. Well, I just don't know. You seem terribly anxious to see your brother put away. Maybe you're just upset with him for stealing your fiancé and trying to take away your job at Merchfield Lead. Nonsense, Mother. I'm not anxious to see anything unfortunate happen to Caldwell. Uh, did the police say when they'd be here with the papers? I don't see them coming up the driveway yet. Maybe you'd better call back to be sure they haven't forgotten. Oh, Rodney, for heaven's sake, get away from that window. I just don't think you realize what 
all is involved here. But I can picture how the newspapers will relish getting their teeth into this story about our prominent and respected family. Ah, here's the clipping file you wanted on the Merchfield case, boss. And you are sure right about them. The old man was a robber baron who built his fortune by hiring lead miners for slave wages. Our readers are going to love it when the sun gets sent away for a good long stretch. Yeah, I'm bringing our top reporters home from all over the world to cover the story. But remember, he's innocent until proven guilty. Oh, so sure. Be, bo- be objective. Oh, sure, boss. I'll drag the old lady's name through the mud, too. Good. Have you dug up any juicy stuff in Agatha Merchfield's early life that we can use to headline tomorrow's special section on the case? I got the whole research staff working on that right now. We already know she went to an Eastern girls finishing school, so we're trying to connect her with the big croquet scandal of 1934. Several of the girls were expelled for kicking a ball through a wicket in the Long Island finals. Okay, keep digging on that. I want to be ready for the presses to roll when Mother faces son in that dramatic courtroom scene. Very well, Mrs. Merchfield. You understand this is only a preliminary hearing, but we need you to identify the low-down thief before an indictment can be voted. Yes, I know there are procedures before you can throw my baby in stir and toss away the key. Right, we'll make this as brief and painless for you as possible. Okay, drag the miserable scum in here. Bring in Caldwell Merchfield. Step lively there. Okay, ma'am. Here's his wallet bearing your son's ID, and here's $239,000 of your money we found in his pocket. So just tell the court, is this man your son Caldwell Merchfield? Yes, but now that I've seen him, I'm convinced that he's the victim of a frame-up staged by some mysterious and evil outsider. Will Caldwell miraculously escape the charges of grand theft that he seems certain to face? Will the police escape charges of false arrest that seem certain to be filed by Caldwell? What about the charges of rigging a croquet game that were never pressed against Agatha? Join us next time when we'll hear the newspaper editor say, Stop the presses! Uh, No, that's okay, never mind. That's in the next exciting episode when we will once again return to Garish Summer. And that brings us around to another edition of the popular Bob and Ray Public Service feature, Your Forum for Fitness. During this segment, we pass on health tips to you listeners from some of the nation's top experts on dieting, weight control, and preventive medicine. Today's subject is proper exercise, and our guest is a man who's, well, he's become a legend in the field of physical fitness over the course of the past half century, Horace Fekety, I hope I pronounced that right. Yes, well, thanks for that glowing introduction. However, uh, uh, Excuse me, I might just add one thing first. Horace Fekety is 74 years old, but thanks to a daily program of jogging, swimming, and aerobics, you're obviously in wonderful condition for a man your age, sir. Well, thanks again for those glowing words. However, I should point out that the background sheet you have there is for my father, Horace Fekety Sr. I'm 46 years old myself. Oh, I see. Well, then... You're not the same Horace Fekety. Well, I'm the same one as myself. It's just that uh, I'm Horace Fekety Jr., and, uh, well, so often happens I'm just not as old as my father. (laughs) Well, of course. (laughs) We booked your dad for the show today. Is he ill or anything? Uh, uh, Certainly not. He's never ill. I I wouldn't want a rumor like that to get started. See, Dad suddenly had to fly out to Omaha today for the opening of the newest Horace Fekety Health Club, so he sent me to fill in since I'm familiar with all the fitness techniques you mean, and everything. You maintain the same sort of rigorous program as your dad? Well, uh, with the exception of the two miles a day of swimming. I don't like it when uh, water gets up my nose, so I skip that. <laughs> well, you substitute some form of exercise that works out the same muscles? Well, I just sit and read the paper while dad swims. Okay, well, let's move on to the portion of the Feckety Fitness program that you do follow and would advocate for our listeners. Well, the important thing to mention is that it doesn't take a lot of time or sore muscles to keep fit. For instance, my first exercise every morning is to bend over and touch my toes ten times, just like this, to limber up. One, two, and one, and two. But, of course, when you do that at home, you're standing up. I beg your pardon? 
Well, you're sitting down now. Most anyone can touch their toes while they're sitting down. I assume you exercise standing up. No, not as a rule. As I say, I do this thing uh, very the first thing in the morning I get out of bed. And I'm in bed at that time, see, lying in kind of a curled-up ball. So I just reach down, touch my toes ten times before I get up. Okay, so that's today's first exercise. What's next? Next, I put both hands on top of my head. Then, pretending that the top of my skull is about to blow off, I press down real hard. I guess that's an isometric exercise to build the arm muscles. Maybe, but I do it to keep the uh, top of my skull from blowing off. I seem to have a lot of hangovers for some reason. Well, even without your (laughs) affliction, it uh, would would be a good exercise. Now, how about running? What about it? Well, do you advocate running every day as part of your fitness program? Ah, that's overrated. Dad used to tell people to run five miles a day, but then he started opening his chain of health clubs and he found it's expensive to build them, you know, large enough to have some a big running track inside. Uh-huh. So uh, that's not part of the program anymore. Well, you mean you're not telling people that a basic exercise isn't needed just because you can't make any money out of it? Is that what you mean? Why, now, wait a minute. I don't have to listen to questions like that from a flabby little weakling <laughs> like you. I'm sorry. It just slipped out. Uh, sit down again. I'm not going to sit down until I taught you a lesson, Buster. Nobody gets a smart mouth around Horace Feckety Jr. Sure, put your fists down. I'm not going to fight with you, so... Just oh, oh I, oh, Mr. Oh, Mr. Feckety, did you hurt yourself? No, no, just give me a hand. I twisted my weak ankle. Yeah, it seemed to buckle just before you went down, <laughs> disappeared under the desk. Yeah, there. too much physical activity does that. The doc says an overweight guy like me should always walk slow and tape up his ankles. Well, it's <laughs> another valuable bit of advice to pass along to our health-conscious listeners. So thanks for all the tips on training, and I hope our audience at home will be on hand again next time when we welcome another guest expert on your forum for fitness. <laughs> And now we're happy to report that Ralph Flinger, Jr. has just walked into the studio. Ralph, I just put Jr. on there. Is that necessary? No, it's all right, Ray. Ralph's the amazing gentleman who's better known as Mr. I Know Where They Are. Uh, Was your father Ralph Flinger? No. No, that's why I thought that Jr. was wrong. Uh, Ralph here has made a lifetime... I'm Ralph Flinger, Sr. My son is Ralph Flinger, Jr. I'm glad we cleared that up. He's made a lifetime career of keeping in touch with thousands of former celebrities who've dropped out of the spotlight. Ralph, the mail just keeps pouring in here from listeners who want, you know, you to tell them uh, what happened to their old-time favorites. Well, it's wonderful to get response like that from the public, Ray. You know, I write 50 to 75 letters every day to different formerly famous people I keep track of. And I know it warms their hearts to read how your listeners still remember them. Well, it seems that all of them have fans out there in Radio Land, Ralph. Uh, This letter that, that came in this morning is typical of those we received. Uh, it's from a woman in Oklahoma. She says that uh, dance marathons were very popular uh, during the Depression years in the part of the country where she grew up. And uh, she remembers a brother and a sister team who walked off with most of the top prizes. Their names were Eddie and Sandra Pardee. And she wonders if uh, you know whatever became of them. Oh, goodness sakes alive, Eddie and Sandra Pardee. I certainly do know what became of them. Of course, Eddie and Sandra had to break up as a team after the dance marathon craze ended. There just wasn't any demand in show business for a couple that did the foxtrot together for as long as six or seven weeks. I can see uh, where there wouldn't be. But did both of the uh, parties make the greatest dances once they split up and went their separate ways? No, I'm sorry to say that neither one of them did too well. Actually, Sandra and Eddie weren't very talented dancers. They were just able to do it for a long time without stopping. Well, I guess that's off on the way. Uh, Where are they today? Well, Sandra Party married into a very socially prominent family in San Francisco, and she's still quite active in the annual wine-tasting events they have out there. Unfortunately, she doesn't see as much as she'd like to of Eddie these days. He lives on a houseboat in Hong Kong. I don't know why he went over there. Well, even without that information, I think you've answered the lady's question. Now I think we have time for just one more letter addressed to Mr. I Know Where They Are. It's from a woman in New Jersey, and she's wondering whatever became of a young heiress who vanished more than 40 years ago while her parents were engaged in a court fight over her custody. The girl's name was Debbie Wadlow. 
And the woman who wrote in wants to know if she was ever found. Oh, my, my, my. I didn't know anyone would still remember the Debbie Wadlow case. She was spirited away right in the middle of her mother and father's court battle involving her custody. Each of the parents accused the other of taking the child, and the police couldn't find a trace of her. Do you mean Debbie never turned up again? Oh, yes. Almost 30 years after the police had closed the case, she wandered out of a wooded area just south of Lansing, Michigan. But neither one of her parents wanted custody of her then. She'd become a very unattractive middle-aged woman. Well, that's an amazing story. Did Debbie explain where she'd been all those years? No, but I have my suspicions. I see. Well... It's, at least it's good to know that Debbie is safe and sound. So uh, thanks for stopping by to bring us up to date on her story, Ralph, and to answer the questions from our other listeners. Not at all, Ray. I always enjoy reliving the past. Goodbye. <laughs> Well, on that note, we're all going to pack up and leave with the hope you'll be with us for the next Bob and Ray show. Today's program was filmed and will be on the first plane out of here for the Cannes Film Festival. All because it was developed and produced for the Radio Foundation by Larry Josephson. Lars Howell was associate producer. Lars tells us he has no particular hobbies at the moment. Paul Tubman wove the musical tapestry for the program, and Al Schaefer the sound effects. Technical director was David Glasser. Engineering assistants were Marty Newman, Miles Smith, and Jay Newland. Production assistance uh, was provided by Bill O'Neill and Charles Whitson, and the program was recorded at Howard Schwartz Studios in New York. Howard was live. Funding provided by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. And from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting through NPR's Satellite Program Development Fund and from public radio station. This is Ray Goulding reminding you to write if you get work. Bob Elliott reminding you to hang by your thumbs. For a free picture of Bob and Ray, send a stamped self-addressed envelope to Bob and Ray Picture, Box 5000 GPO, New York 10116. Again, send a stamped self-addressed envelope to Bob and Ray Picture, Box 5000 GPO, New York 10116. We regret that we cannot send a picture without a stamped self-addressed envelope. This program was independently produced by the Radio Foundation. And now, from approximately coast to coast, it's the Bob and Ray Radio Show. Thanks, Paul. How are you today? Pretty good, thank you, good. Uh, Ray. It or Bob, I'm sorry. Looked as if you were in very good shape when you came in a few minutes ago. <laughs> nice of you to say that. If you surprised, you look very natty today, too. Well, I got a new suit, <clears throat> and uh, it's double-breasted, as you can see, and that yeah. takes pounds off your waist. I guess it does. I, yeah. I don't favor that style myself, but... What is the style you favor, anyway? Uh, I don't know what, what you'd call it. I don't think there's a name to it, but... Kind of gay 90s? Kind of like that, yeah. yeah. But uh, let's get to our first to feature here today because we have understandable pride in presenting it. The uh, public service feature is speaking out portion of the program where we urge all of you at home to call in with your opinion on some controversial issue of the day. That's right, friends. It's a wonderful thing we're doing here, and I'm sure we could have won all kinds of national awards for it, but uh, we're holding back to apply for the Nobel <laughs> Peace Prize. Well, now, this is the first time I heard you were planning to do that, Ray. I think, frankly, it's a ridiculous idea. Too. Well, I don't know why. We've got uh, big money tied up in broadcasting equipment here. And yeah. We're offering to let all the crackpots use it to spout off. Yes. I think that... Uh, that shows we got a lot of nerve. Well, I'm not sure that's all it takes to win the Nobel Peace Prize. However, we can't discuss it now because our first call is coming in from one of those crackpots you mentioned. Hello, would you give us your name, please? Yes, my name is 522 West Elm Street Lafferty. That's a very unusual name, and I bet there's a story that goes with it, huh? No, not really. Uh, my mom just had a poor memory. And she figured that if she named me after our street address, that uh, she'd have a better chance of remembering who I was or where we lived or both. 
Well, I guess that was a good idea. Well, no, it wasn't. Uh, when I was two months old, we moved. Oh, that's too bad, but probably has no bearing on the opinion you called in to give, so... Probably right. right. Okay, the opinion I want to give is that the phone company should set up area codes for different parts of the country. Now, see, that way people could call long distance without going through the operator. Well, I don't see how that differs from well, the system. Well, just, just, don't be in such a hurry to condemn this idea. You oh. haven't heard the whole thing. You okay. see, I found there are no local phone exchanges that have a one or a zero as the second digit. Mm. So you could use those for long distance. Like uh, New York City could be uh, well, 506, Detroit could be 817. And like that. Well, you know, as it happens, New York is 212 and Detroit is 313. Well, I don't care what numbers they pick. It's just the basic idea I wanted to tell you about. Uh huh. And you claim you thought of it yourself, do you? No, I say I'm at a party and we were just clowning around when another guy thought of it, oh. but he decided I should be the one to call and tell you. Well, I'm sure he'll have something to say to you after you hang up. While you do that, I'm going to take another call. Your name, please? I'm Ms. Hugo Ormsby of Enid, Oklahoma. It's my opinion that my neighbors, the Hansingers, shouldn't let their cat run loose. Well, that's not really an opinion on public affairs, ma'am. Well, I don't believe you'll ever find a cat that has more public affairs than Fluffy. I think you're just siding with the Hansingers on this thing. No, I'm not even acquainted with the Hansingers. Well, they're the people next door who let their cat run loose. I know. I now, are you going to do something about it, or aren't you? No, I think I've done all I can, so I'll just move along to one final quick question. Uh, your name, please. I'm Shorty Kavir. I live around the corner from that place they closed down last week. I think I read about that. What do you want to discuss? It's my opinion that the Indiana Pacers basketball team should be moved to Cheyenne, Wyoming. Oh, why? Well, the guys play like they're half asleep sometimes, and I just thought it might wake them up if they'd move someplace where there's always a lot of crisp, cold air. Well, that's your idea for turning the Pacers into a winner, is it? No, my idea for turning them into a winner is to trade the whole team for Larry Bird, but uh, I didn't want to make a suggestion that would be considered impractical. Well, I agree. Moving the franchise to Cheyenne is a lot more realistic. Thanks for uh, taking that clear-headed approach, and... I hope the rest of you listeners may do that next time when we'll invite you to take part in another session of Speaking Out. And it's uh, time now for another story of drama and suspense. Another tale well designed to keep you in anxiety. And here, once again, to set the stage for today's yarn is the widely known adventurer and world traveler, Commander Neville Putney. Commander, I presume that you reached into your amazing file of stories and brought forth another tale, well designed to keep our listeners in... anxiety. Yes, indeed I have, young man. Our story today takes place aboard a crack passenger train rocketing its way across the western United States. In the coaches and private compartments, the people were enjoying the scenery and all appeared to be going well. But in the cabin of the locomotive, the engineer turned to the fireman with panic written on his face. George, something's gone wrong with the air brake system. Gad, Emil, you're right. We must be doing at least 75. Cut the steam and let her coast to a stop. It's no good, George. Don't you realize where we are? Ah, oh, I'd almost forgotten we're almost to Flagstaff Hill. Right, George. We're going to go rocketing down the steepest grade in the Rockies at full speed. Yeah, Emo, the hairpin curve is at the bottom. If we can't take that curve at this speed, we'll jump the track for sure. Exactly what's going to happen. George, there's no way we can slow down. We'll be doing at least 100 by the time we hit hairpin curve. Yeah, Emo, the lives of over 200 passengers are in our hands and we can't do a thing. Baggage will probably be all smashed, too. I'd blow an SOS on the whistle if I thought it'd do any good, but there isn't time. We're less than half a mile from Flagstaff Hill right now. Good, Emil. It's been nice working with you. Uh, nice working with you, George. I guess it's the way for a railroader to go. High balling down the hill with a hand on the throttle. Goodbye, George. Good luck. Well, there. How about that for a story of drama and suspense? Oh, hey. That was a, <laughs> that was a real thrill, Commander. But uh, you can't just leave us in anxiety that way. Did George and Emil get out of the accident okay? <laughs> well, oddly enough, there wasn't any accident at all. But they were going down Flagstaff Hill, but the brakes gone. No. George and Emil were mistaken about that. They were thinking this was a westbound run. Actually, they were going east. 
That meant they had to go up Flagstaff Hill rather than down. Naturally, when the train reached that steep upgrade, it stopped of its own accord. George and Emil took it on into Denver at reduced speed and had the brakes fixed there. Well, uh... <coughs> In other words, uh, this wasn't a story of drama and intrigue at all. Just another one of your uh, lead balloons. Ah, you ruddy young bounder. I've warned you time and again about voicing your opinions on the amazing stories I take from my files. The only amazing thing about your file is that so many dull stories could be collected in one place. Mm, if you are in my regiment, you'd do time in the guardhouse for a statement like that. Okay, but you sure laid an egg today. Cheeky young blighter. Now read the announcement. Be sure to join us next time when Commander Putney will again reach into a amazing file and draw forth another tale well designed to keep us in anxiety oh hey now it's time to gain some more valuable tips for you home handymen as we pay another of our regular visits to the basement workshop of fred falvey the do-it-yourselfer Fred, I see that you've added an early American touch to the workshop since we were here last. I really like that old-fashioned gas lamp on the wall over there. Well, installing that was really a do-it-yourself project to save money, Ray. The gas main running by the house sprang a leak recently, so I just bought a few lengths of number five metal pipe and then used some simple tools to tunnel out to the gas main and plug into the leak. Well, that's certainly an original idea that I'm sure all our beloved friends of the radio audience will want to remember. The lamp you've attached to the wall there is giving off a, a very cheerful flame. And I suppose there's no danger at all in letting that leak in the gas line go unrepaired. Oh, I suppose there's always a chance it could get bigger or cause a violent explosion, but in the meantime, I'm saving almost $3 a month on my utility bill. So there you have it, dear listeners, just one more example of better living by doing it yourself. Fred, I know our home handymen are all eager to hear about the workshop project that you've chosen to describe to them this week. This week, Ray, I've chosen to describe a very practical workshop project to all the home handymen listening in. I'm sure they're well aware of how much it costs these days to call in a plumber to fix a dripping faucet. Yes, we all know it costs a great deal. So today, you're going to demonstrate how to tighten the faucet with an ordinary household wrench. Is that right, Fred? Today, I'm going to demonstrate how to make a faucet washer with an ordinary household hammer and saw. Well, that should save us lots of money. How's that go? Well, you need a metal washer in there to stop the dripping. Pipe fittings get loose and corroded over the years. Luckily, a very serviceable washer can be made by cutting a hole in the center of a 25-cent piece. You mean an ordinary quarter like we carry in our pocket to get from the bank? Exactly. Yeah. I found that quarters are readily available at almost any full-service bank. And unlike many of the workshop supplies we have to go out and buy, there is no sales tax or retail markup of any kind on common coins. Well, that's money saved right there. But as I recall, Fred, a washer normally has a hole in the center and a quarter doesn't. How do you, uh, how do you get around that problem? Well, that's the do-it-yourself project I'm going to demonstrate right now. Now, you see, Ray, I've laid a quarter out perfectly flat here on the workbench. And I'm going to make the necessary hole by pounding a nail through the center and then smoothing the edges with an ordinary rat tail file. Well, I'm anxious to see exactly how that's done. I assume it's, uh, it's not illegal. To deface money in that way. Well, actually, I think it may be against the law, Ray, but I've never heard of federal agents coming into a workshop and arresting a handyman for doing it. Well, I guess it's okay, then. So, uh, go ahead. Really quite simple. I just hole an ordinary roofing nail in an upright position over the center of the quarter here, and then I'll strike the head of the nail with this number four ball-peen hammer. Ow! See, yeah, uh, that looks, uh... Wait a minute. That takes a... <clears throat> Quite a bit of hammering to get that through the quarter, Fred. Mm. Sure bent the nail pretty badly. Well, roofing nails are very inexpensive, so even if you have to use three or four of them to punch a hole in the quarter, you're still money ahead. I see. And then you say you smooth down the hole there with a file? A rat tail file is what it has to be inside that small nail hole, but uh -huh. I won't take time to demonstrate the filing now. It usually requires several hours of work to enlarge the hole enough and make sure you keep it perfectly round. But uh, eventually... Uh you do get a workable faucet washer. Yes. Of course, you may also have to file down the outside of the quarter to make it fit your plumbing, but I installed one of these in our kitchen sink almost a week ago, and it hasn't dripped at all since. So, for just the price of a quarter, few nails, little effort, the high cost of a visit from the plumber, 
has been avoided. And thus, fond listeners, we've witnessed one more example of how to live better by doing it yourself. Direct from the basement workshop of Fred Falvey, the do-it-yourselfer. <laughs> Come with us now as we return once again to Garish Summit and its endless story of intrigue among the socially prominent. There in stately splendor, far removed from the squalid village below, they fight their petty battles over power and money. As our drama continues, wealthy Agatha Merchfield is going over the books of the family-owned lead mining company when her spineless son Rodney enters. Agatha looks up and speaks. Rodney, it appears that uh, you may have been right all along in accusing your shifty brother Caldwell of misdeeds. I feel that I owe you an apology. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed, Mother. You've never apologized to me for anything before. Shut up, Rodney. Why must you always interrupt when I'm talking? Oh, sorry, Mother. Please continue. I've just been reviewing the company books. Seems that Caldwell has written checks totaling several million dollars to a mysterious figure known only as Mr. Big. Oh, that would be the underworld gambling czar, Harold W. Big. I have reason to believe that Caldwell was deeply in his debt. Rodney, will you let me finish what I'm saying, or do you plan to continue chirping in like this? Oh, forgive me, Mother. I guess I'm just carried away with grief to hear about all the shame Caldwell has brought on the family. Really? I thought you'd be delighted to know that I've sworn out a warrant for his arrest, which means I'll be reinstating you as president of Merchfield Lead. Well, of course, that's wonderful news. I'm really overjoyed. With only a tinge of that grief, I thought you'd want me to feel. I really don't care how you feel, Rodney. I just want you to go to police headquarters and lend any assistance you can in helping to find Caldwell. I can't imagine where he's hiding from the law. Ah, there you are, Master Caldwell. I'm sorry I took so long to respond, but it's been years since anyone has used this old bell pull in the attic to ring for the butler. Well, that's okay, Wilfred. I just like to crouch up here under the eaves sometimes. It helps me think. I understand, sir. And I presume another advantage of remaining here is that the police will soon arrive to search the rest of the house for you. Oh, that doesn't add into it all. Uh, talking to the fuzz doesn't bother me. I have nothing to hide. Of course not, sir. Would you care to have me fetch a pillow so you won't have to hunker down behind that old birdcage on the bare floor? No, what I'd like to have you do is uh, pack a bag for me and then bring it to the bottom of the fire escape at midnight. I plan to take my vacation early, and I don't want to go through a long, tearful goodbye with Mother or anybody else. Very good, sir. Will that be all? No, uh, just one other thing, Wilfred. Go over the whole house with a dust cloth. I've probably left a lot of fingerprints on things, and I hate to think what would happen if the cops ever found out who I really am. Faith and Bagara, I don't know what to make of this FBI report on young Caldwell Merchfield. Me neither, Lieutenant. They say he's not in the computer file of any government agency, including the Census Bureau. Faith and Bagara. What about the social security number we got from his place of business? The FBI says it was issued a few months ago to a John Doe. That's spelled D-O-E, Dog Ocean Easy. Faith and Bagar, that's a common enough spelling, and it gives us little to go on, lad. That's right, Lieutenant. In fact, I say it gives us only one thing to go on. Faith and Bagara, and what might that be? Well, it seems that the guy who's been calling himself Caldwell Merchfield is really someone else. Someone who's gone to a lot of trouble to keep his true identity from becoming known. Ken Caldwell succeed in getting away from his attic hiding place without detection? Can Wilford be trusted to pack enough swim trunks in case Caldwell decides to vacation in Brazil? And what about the mysterious figure who claims to be a police lieutenant? Perhaps we'll learn more next time when we hear Agatha say... Now that you mention it, I don't recall ever giving birth to more than one son. That's in our next thrilling episode when we return again to Garish Summit. Well, today we're pleased to inaugurate a brand new Bob and Ray public service feature, Your Forum for Fitness. During this segment of the show, we'll be 
chatting with noted experts on diet, exercise, preventive medicine, things like that. Today, our first guest is a man whose research in the field of nutrition has produced some valuable health tips for all of us. He's Mr. Bertram Fenwright. Or is it uh, Dr. Fenright? No, it's Mr. Years ago, I decided there were already enough quack doctors around trying to make a fast buck off sick people, so I chose to go into the uh, more noble field of nutrition. Now, I wanted to spend my life helping people achieve good health through proper diet. Well, it's wonderful to have a guest expert who's also a humanitarian like yourself, sir. Well, I don't mean to blow my own horn, but I saw a large area in the nutrition field where my tireless efforts were needed, and... As I mentioned before, there were already enough vultures with medical degrees who are happy to get rich at the expense of sick people. Yes, I think you've already made your feelings about doctors very clear. So why don't you tell us about this new area in the field of health maintenance where you saw a need for your skills? Well, I found that fat people on diets were getting almost uh, no advice at all on choosing their between-meal snacks. I see. I thought most weight control programs advised against eating between meals, though. No, not that I know of. I've uh, glanced at several of those uh, fad diet books. It seems they deal exclusively with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They never mention what you should eat the rest of the time. In other words, they don't offer much guidance on selecting between meal snacks. That's right. And believe me, it doesn't do any good to stick with veggies and stuff like that at mealtime if you're going to fill up on chocolate eclairs an hour later. No, I can see how that uh, would make it hard to lose weight. Absolutely. Your system doesn't know whether whether it's mealtime or bedtime. Do you follow me? Yes, and what you say makes a great deal of sense, nutritionally. Thank you. I wish more doctors could see the value of my discoveries. You know, they're not as smart as they want their victims to think. Well, I don't think you need to get back to your feelings about doctors. Let's discuss these amazing discoveries you've made in the field of between-meal eating. Now, you already mentioned that chocolate eclairs are a no-no, right? That's right. They're bad for your teeth. They also contain a lot of those things that make people fat. Now, what do you call those things? Calories, you mean? Yeah, calories, that's it. Eclairs are loaded with them. And uh, the interesting thing is that you can fill up between meals with stuff that's uh, not nearly as fattening, like pretzels, for instance. Well, that's a good thing to know. Pretzels contain fewer calories than chocolate eclairs, right? That's correct. Potato chips are okay, too, but they're kind of noisy to eat. And that disturbs people around you if you... Go to one of those uh, health farms where the patients are trying to meditate. That raises a point. Do you advise overweight people to go to a health farm to get rid of the excess pounds more quickly? No, that's not necessary. In fact, a health farm is a terrible place to be if you want to get up and have a snack in the middle of the night. It's usually a long walk from your room to the kitchen. Yeah, well, being at home is more convenient for middle-of-the-night snacking. I'm sure of that. I guess your nutrition program... Does permit those, does it? Only if you eat the right thing. Now, a lot of people are half asleep at 3 a.m., and they'll just eat sugar straight out of the sack rather than prepare something more nutritious. What do you suggest for those late-night trips to the kitchen? I like to keep a large box of graham crackers handy myself. They can be eaten dry, or they can be uh, mushed up in milk. Mm -hmm. And they contain fewer of those uh, things we were talking about than sugar does. You're speaking of calories. That's right. The body doesn't burn those up very fast when you're asleep. So you have to stick with lighter food late at night. Now, if you don't care for graham crackers, then I'd suggest a few slices of plain white bread with butter. That's filling, too. Well, you've certainly given us some valuable tips, Mr. Fenwright, and I do want to thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure, and I want to thank you for providing that hoist to bring me up to the studio since I'm a little too heavy to get in the elevator. We're glad to be of service. Thanks again. And I hope all you listeners who are striving for a healthier life will join us again soon for another edition of Your Forum for Fitness. Hi, this is Sergeant Ben Royster, and this is your Army Amateur Hour. We're here on the flight deck of the aircraft carrier Flywheel, and I see our first amateurs ready for a try for the coveted Drill Talent Award. The finals to be held at the Army Frogman School at Everglades Field, October 6th. Step up, Captain, and tell us your name. I'm Seaman Second Class Holly Lester. I see. And are you stationed on this ship, Captain? No, I'm on detached service from a torpedo boat. We're alongside the flywheel for repairs. Well, just see that uh, you don't set off any of those torpedoes around here, Lieutenant. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
What talent uh, do you bring to the deck of the flywheel, mate? Well, I do an imitation of a tunnel policeman tending to his duties during the day. And what method do you use to get the hollow-voiced effect we so often associate with tunnels, Captain? Well, I kind of do it by holding my head in the empty brass casing of a 16-inch uh, shell here. Well, imitations are always effective, so here he is, pharmacist mate Harley Lester imitating a tunnel policeman while his head is in an empty shell. All right. Keep moving. That's right. Fifteen feet apart. Dim your lights. Keep fifteen feet apart. That's it. Fifteen feet apart. Fifteen is the magic number here. Crash! All right. Let's bring the traffic to a halt. All right. It's nothing serious. We'll all be moving along in a second here, just as soon as the record shows up. We'll all be moving. And when we do, stay 15 feet apart. 15 feet. Well, that was a mighty fine seaman first class Harley Lester, and it didn't escape me that what you did was more of a vignette than an imitation. Well, uh, do I make the semifinals, Sergeant? No, there's a rule against vignettes on this show, but you are eligible for our next show to be held up in Fairbanks. Thank you, seaman. And now I see our next contestant is here, and my card says it's Admiral, Vice Admiral Hector Ravenswood Far- F- Parsley. Did I get that right, mate? <laughs> Hardly. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, you see, I'm Vice Admiral Hector Ravenswood Parsley. <clears throat> All right. Keep it down. Uh, let's get on with the show, Sailor. Uh, what talent do you have that you think will bring you closer to the coveted Drill Talent Award? Well, I got this weather balloon from the boys in meteorology last year. And I found that by blowing up the balloon, I could... Uh, wait, get... wait, wait a minute. Are you going to make music from a balloon, mate? Why, uh, yes. Oh, that's an old stunt. We like originality on our show. So I doubt you'll even reach the quarterfinals. Uh, what tune uh, can you get out of it, mister? Well, I've been uh, practicing on smiles. You know the one? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's get on with it. We don't want to have you up here too long. Right now, here's Hector Parsley playing smiles on a balloon. Well, how was that, Sergeant? They should cancel your pension, Admiral. You may know how to run a boat, but the mysteries of the musical balloon obviously escape you. Go take a dip, Admiral. And now this is Sergeant Ben Royster bidding you goodbye from the flight deck of the carrier flywheel. (laughs) We'll be talking to you next week from Glover Field in Fairbanks, home of the famous 122nd Payroll Financial Section. See you then. And mention my name in Sheboygan as performed by our musical director Paul Talman certainly means something. Well, it means, Bob, that he's been following directions and is telling us another Bob and Ray show is about over. We'll get back to the drawing board and start working on another after we just remind you that the program is developed and produced for the Radio Foundation by Larry Josephson, who hasn't yet decided how he voted in the Burger of the Year election. Associate producer is Lars Howell, whose hobby is designing toboggans. Our sound effects were provided, as usual, by Al Schaefer, and technical director was David Glasser, who's uh, had several nasty encounters with automatic garage door openers. Engineering assistants Marty Newman, Miles Smith, and Jay Newland. Production assistants Bill O'Neill and Charles Whitson. Our program was recorded by Howard Schwartz Studios in New York. Howard, incidentally, owns one of the world's largest collections of zoot suits in the United States. Funding is by a major grant from the National Endowment of the Arts, additional funding from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting through NPR's Satellite Program Development Fund, and from public radio stations. And now this is Ray Golding reminding you to write if you get work. Bob Elliott reminding you to hang by your thumbs. For a free picture of Bob and Ray, send a stamped self-addressed envelope to Bob and Ray Picture, Box 5000 GPO, New York 10116. 
Again, send a stamped, self-addressed envelope to Bob and Ray Picture, Box 5000 GPO, New York 10116. We regret that we cannot send a picture without a stamped, self-addressed envelope. This program was independently produced by the Radio Foundation.